Um, uh, short and sweet, um, we're going to talk a little bit about kids tennis. Most people know where we're at with it. It's a bit of an update for some of you and for others. Um, uh, just, just some sort of reminders and flags on a few things. Um, I'm just, just, just going to try and keep it as interactive as possible because it's after lunch, which means everyone goes into that. Uh, yeah. So you have um, one role, and that is to make sure the person next to you doesn't snore if they fall asleep. Yeah, so just elbow like that's the manoeuvre you need to use. If they start going, you just that's the one there, and bring them right back to earth. Right? If you feel yourself going, this is the technique you go. You go here, here, here. All right. You just have to be a little bit more careful while you're driving. All right. So let's start with a question. We are all coaches in sport. We're all coaches in tennis. Where does sport come from? Where did sport start? Tell the person next to you where you think sport started. Okay? Interesting question, isn't it, really? You'll see where it's going in a minute. Where did sport start? Okay, all right, anyone got any good answers? Ancient Greece, Athens. Ancient Greece with the Olympics, and that's what we would all normally think, yeah? Ancient Greece and the Olympics, but that's actually what you're talking about is formal sport where we recognized it and we gave trophies and prizes and those kind of things. Yeah, and technically speaking, 6000 BC was the first ever race that was recorded and medals were given through that whole, pro even before the Olympics had started. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, so if you like, sport actually starts long before we start giving prizes for it. Because sport has a mission, and this is the reason most people did sport. Sport was training for battle. That means there were definitely some Vikings who were sportsmen there, somewhere in there. Yeah? All right, so it started off being, right, let's get our group together, let's, let's throw spears, throw axes. Yes, I've done my box set of Ragnarok on Netflix this week. Don't bother, it's not worth it, right? But it started with all of those kind of things. It started with team games that were designed to get the warriors to work together. So ultimately, what I want you to think about is we're in a mold now where we think there is actually an outlet based purely on sport. We've created a model that now says you can become a sports person. But there was a time at which you couldn't become a sports person Sport was just a vehicle for you to develop some skills that you could use in your life. And really that's where we need to get a little bit back to. Because the problem is if we only go down this line of we're looking for the next Casper, everything else becomes a failure. Yeah, so the next question really is, so if sport provides things that we can um, that can benefit somebody's life, that can help them improve elements of their life, what are those things? Yeah, and how do we focus on those things? Because there's one stage, for example, that people say, tennis, tennis helps build life skills. Okay, anyone ever heard that? Tennis or tennis or sport helps build life skills. That's like saying going to school makes you intelligent. Going to school doesn't make you intelligent. If you focus on the right things at school, you can become intelligent. But we know a lot of stupid people who went to school. Yeah? So ultimately, it, becomes down, it comes down to, and this is a little question for you and your program, is what's really the most valuable thing in your program? Because the most valuable thing is not tennis. The most valuable thing is what tennis provides for you. So, that made a lot of people like look up at a little cloud up in the sky. Is there anything in that cloud or are you just going, seriously, I should have had another coffee if he's going to talk about this kind of stuff. All right, so person next to you right now, okay, well, what is the value in what you do? If you're in Tromsø in the middle of like the darkest, deepest Norway, 
yeah, where the sun comes out for 12 minutes a year or whatever it is, right? <laughs> what is it that you're really selling? What is it that you're really putting out there on the court? Right, just one minute while I work out how to change the slide. Tell the person next to you, yeah? What is it then? Come on then. What is it? Because it's not a forehand and a backhand. So, any answer longer than 30 seconds long is not worth it, so we'll just move on. Um, now, I'm willing to wholly, openly admit, sorry, by the way, I've got a cold, so I'm trying to not cough all the way through this presentation. I'm wholly, openly admit that's not the reason I got into t this. I didn't get into tennis with some idea of, like, teaching some kids some amazing things. I was like, I like tennis, and um, I think I can make some money. And um, I think I'll teach that game to kids, yeah? But if you actually get down to, you know, what kids want from tennis, those are the kind of things that are really important to them, yeah? There's a lot of social things in that and interactive things in that and relationship-based things in that. Not what you know about tennis, what you know about people. And interestingly, we know that, and one of the big questions we have now in Norway is how can we create a model where the kids that come into Tennis Kids continue to play tennis in their teenage years? And one of those things is competence. Because what we also know is that most kids at 10 years old are actively engaged in five different activities. They do five different things. One of them might be with their thumbs, yeah, but they do five different things. But by the time we get to 13, so it's on average, obviously, there's no such thing as a half a thing, but they've halved the number of different activities they do. Because competence is hugely important to your social identity. And now everybody knows if you're good at something or if you're not good at something. Because we have this false world around us called social media. And you know what social media presents. Social media presents a world in which everybody else's life is better than yours. Because you never post a picture of you looking like crap on social media. My girlfriend, wherever we go, we have to take pictures. I'm never in her social media profile. I still haven't quite worked out that one out like that yet. She travels the world, apparently without me, although I'm always there taking pictures. Not quite sure how this works. But the average number of pictures I have to take before I get approval for one is 52. No, 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 no. Do all that again. No, no, no. Oh, that one might be okay, but hold on, let's do another set. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? So basically, one of the interesting things for us is now, if you are seen to be incompetent or not perfect or not great at something, you never post that. And so whenever you look at anyone else's profile, in their world, they always look like they're having a better time than you are. And so competence becomes a huge thing. Relationships become a huge thing. And if we want, we want kids to stay in tennis, they have to feel like tennis is one of their things. Tennis is one of their things. Yeah? So what makes somebody good at tennis. How would you judge your program? What does success look like? If, I, if you said to me, you have a good kids tennis program, why would you have a good te kids tennis program? What's good about it? Tell the person next to you. 30 seconds is all you get, go. <laughs>
so there's never been there's never been an easier time to sell tennis in Norway, has there? It's not still an easy sell. It's still easier to sell stuff involving snow. But there's never been an easier time to sell tennis in Norway. So getting people through the door and just getting them on the court is probably not enough to say you've got a good program. Instead, these would be the measures that we'd encourage you to use. And these are the measures that we track all programs by. How many kids come enough times a week to be competent? Once a week tennis is a pathway to being very, very average at tennis and eventually giving up. Reality. Okay, it doesn't matter what it is, music, art, language, sport, stripping if Bill's still here. If you only do it once a week, you're not going to get good at it. Okay? Alright, so somewhere along the line, you have to do it enough. So, a kid is a kid if they come to the tennis club at least a couple of times a week because that's just enough to get the snowball rolling down the hill. A kid who's committed wants to play beyond a lesson. So, they want to play some kind of tournament or some kind of event, whatever that is. And if you put something on, they want to come to it. In other words, there's a level of commitment to what they do. Okay, And that because of that, they do enough, they have a goal, and they make progress. Pretty simple equation, really. Yeah? And because of that, they don't give up. Because we don't give up the things that we are competent at. So Bill threw in the word fun in his presentation, but some of you will know that I don't like the word fun, because I think it's a cop-out. People use it to mean a sugar rush. Fun should be, fun ha, if fun has a level of competence attached to it, it's good, solid, healthy fun. We like the things we're good at. You're involved in tennis because it's something you feel you're competent at. And if you can equate that same kind of thing to a kid's tennis, look at that profile of that kid. The kid comes several times a week, right? They play in tournaments, they're making progress in your program, they're not going to go anywhere, especially if they're in Tromsø, they can't go anywhere, there's nowhere to go. Yeah? Alright? They're not going to go anywhere. So ultimately, if you start measuring your program, whether it's healthy or not, it's not how many people you've got coming through the door and how much money you made, it's are they doing those things? And how many more kids, out of all the kids you have, can you get to do those things? Pretty simple equation. And we know that traditionally where we've got to in our program at this point is Tennis Kids started as Tennis School and it started with the tour but we have to move way beyond this idea of it's about the tour and actually get down to we have to deliver better lessons, we have to communicate better with parents, we have to meet these kids' social needs. When you have friends, you don't leave. Yeah, I got two deals this year with professional tennis players because they're Manchester United fans. No joke. I'm a Manchester United fan. Most people from London are actually Manchester United fans because it's nowhere near London, basically. That's what all Manchester United fans are like. Most Manchester United fans have never been to Manchester. Okay? And these two professional tennis players, after we had a nice conversation, we started talking about soccer and they told me they're Manchester United fans. And we're Man I'm a Manchester United fan and boom, I have a contract. Quite interesting how you have an affinity to people on all kinds of different levels. Yeah? Because social is about connecting. Do you remember, 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 remember Carlos's presentation from last year, the definition of the word club? People that are like me. Yeah, people that are like me. So it's basically just getting people to connect and belong. And then the other thing we have to do better of is we have to organise um, much better opportunities to play within our club environment. We can't depend on competition as being kick the bird out the nest and experience it the first time on the tour. So right now we're at this stage where we still have to be better at all of those kind of areas and we still have room for improvement. That's what our workshop on Sunday is going to be about for those of you coming now. 
we're going to focus on those kind of areas and we're moving away from this is what the tour is all about because I think everybody knows that already. <coughs> and within those spaces, I want to just give you a, real, a few quick slides to look at an overview of where you're at because there is a bit of a challenge. Um, the challenge is that we look at a program and we expect the program to do the job. The program is simply the car. Yep. So I like this analogy that a good program has a great car, a great map and a great driver. And if one of those three things is missing, you're not going to hit your destination. So if you have a great map, you've got no idea where you're going. Sorry, you haven't got a great map, you've got no idea where you're going. If you haven't got a great car, you struggle to get there. And if the driver's really bad, yeah, it would be like you know, Volvo saying every Norwegian on the planet gets a Volvo tomorrow. Sounds like a great idea, except if they gave one to everyone, even if they can't drive, you'd drive down the street and you'd see loads of crashed Volvos, which granted is the safest car in the world to crash in, but you would then go, they're probably not a great car. So ultimately, our program gets judged not just based on what we can deliver in terms of resources, but also the quality of you as a driver and what your attention to detail is. And that map even, if we start looking at that, and where that's at, that might need a little bit of a rethink. Because traditionally we look at our map as being based around lessons. How many of this level kid have I got? How many of this level kid have I got? But actually if we really think about it, if we go back to what's a healthy program, it should be we have a skill progression because that shows the kids are improving. We have a competitive progression where we have kids who are gradually wanting to do more and more and more and more. We have kids who experience tennis in the club, love it. Okay, I want to do the next thing. Okay, go and play the tour. Right, love it. Want to do the next thing. Okay, go and play national championships. Want to do the next thing. And we're looking at that as much as a pathway. And also, you know that this year we're talking a lot about behaviours. And behaviours are really, really important because Behaviours are the thing that everybody can control. So if Lance and I both turn up at the tennis club on the same day, age six years old, and Lance has two older brothers who've beaten him up, thrown him down the stairs, thrown things at his head, done all these general things that make you a better athlete, okay? He's more athletic, whereas my mum decided, poor little Mikey needs to sit on the sofa because he might fall over and cut his knee watch some TV, it's not my fault that I'm a fat little blob who can't, has no athletic skills. And it's not Lance's fault that he's athletic. So somewhere along the line, if we reward and recognise behaviours, we can both be successful. And it sounds a bit cliche, but ultimately by starting to look beyond skills and starting to understand that if we actually recognise and reward our four core behaviours, we'll touch on it in a bit, then everyone can be successful and feel like they're making a progression and feel like they're accepted and respected and they belong. And beyond that, we have to get back to remember what kids wanted. Because that map has to make sure that I not only become more competent, because I'll enjoy it more, but I also become socially better. So I make friends. Yeah. And within that, gradually, I develop all the other skills that I needed that sport was originally intended to teach me. I had a conversation the other day with a parent in the US and she said, uh, yeah, I want my kid to be a professional tennis player. And I said, well, would you settle for them being a CEO of a company? She went, what? I said, well, would you be happy if they were a CEO of a multinational company? She said, yeah, I think so, why? I said, well, if you want to be a professional tennis player or you want to be a CEO of a company, actually, it's the same set of attributes that you really need. You need to be respectful, you need to work hard, you need to deal with adversity, you need to be good at problem solving, you need to have good social skills. If you don't have those skills, it's very unlikely you're going to be a professional tennis player or do very well out of it. But guess what, if we focus on those skills, if we focus on those areas, you can get those things from being involved in tennis. Oh, and therefore, if you don't make it on the tour, you might just end up being a CEO of a company because you have those skills. See, those are the skills, when we get back to it, that are really important in what we're teaching every day. 
And then last year we touched a little bit briefly on this, but I'll touch it on uh, briefly again. And what are your skills as a driver of this car? Remember, I don't, those of you that were around last year, we talked about three roles of a coach. The policeman, the doctor, and the bartender. We fall into those roles all the time. You need to be a very effective organiser. That's the policeman. Keep order, keep structure. Keeps everyone safe, lets everyone know where they are. You need to be a great doctor. A doctor doesn't just have great analytical skills, they have a great bedside manner. And then you need to be that person that everyone can talk about their problems with to build relationships. And when you do that, it's not just with the kids that you teach, but also with the parents that you work with, and the board members, and your colleagues. And we all know a weird doctor in the coaching profession. Or a weird policeman. No one really likes them. Especially the doctor that's the geek of tennis but actually can't build relationships for love nor money. So even within our profession we know people that are weaker and stronger at these particular areas. But if you can't do all those three things you kind of struggle to be a great driver of a programme. Yeah, so it's worth looking at those three and actually just sitting down there for a bit and saying, um, we've, we've done this a few times now, but ask somebody to watch your lesson. What percentage of that lesson was your communication about telling people what to do? What percentage was about helping them get better? And what percentage was about building relationships? Because we also know a whole load of coaches that don't teach a lot, but build great relationships and the people keep coming back. So it's an interesting dynamic. And we have to understand that we're still, at the heart of all of this, being the most effective tennis coach we can be. Which means understanding the people right, who are right in front of us. Understanding who we're teaching, what's driving them, why they came. What's the difference between a first child and a third child? What's the difference between a nine-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl? Yeah. And that we're trying to get them to fall in love with the game of tennis. And we have to be really careful. And I put this slide up there. Um, fun is about creating competence and don't apologize for tennis. Well, and what do I mean by that? It's very simple. No kid got a soccer ball on Christmas morning, ran out and put it in the middle of the street and said, let's pretend it's a spaceship. Other sports don't apologize for who they are. Other sports don't pretend yeah, that we have to dress it up in fancy bows to make it attractive. Okay? Other sports present tennis with the passion and the enthusiasm that they've got. They'll present the role models. We have superhero role models. We have some of the most recognised sports people in the world. Right? Especially in Norway. Right? One. Alright, one. All right. But everybody else, yeah, in the world, and then we don't talk about them. So it's really important because the average seven-year-old kid has five people that they can tell you that they want to be when they grow up. Five people, real people, not Batman, Superman. Five real people. Yeah? So let's see if we can make one of those a tennis player. Yeah, let's see if we can make a couple of those tennis players. Because I know on average in England, Three of the five are soccer players, for boys. That's average. That means for some kids, all five of them are soccer players. And you've heard soccer players interviews. You know that they're not the most intelligent people on the earth. Yeah? It's like, I'm going to give it 100% and then my team gave it 100%. So we gave it 100% and next week we'll give it 100%. Thank you very much. All right. So I think we can find some slightly better role models in tennis. And then if we get back to the environment, the, other, the third element, we have to make sure that what's in the environment for our kids is something that's going to be exciting for them as well. We have to make sure that the court belongs to them that they feel like we're serious about putting the right balls in the right court and the right space out there. We, we'll, we have to make sure that we recognise the achievements that they've made. And we'll talk about this again on Sunday, that 
We've now focused on those four behaviours because we know that behaviours trump skills. It's nothing to do with the orange fella in America. It means the word trump in England means English means two things. One is to get better than something and the other one means to fart, which is quite logical and irrelevant really, but uh, probably back to another Bill Stripper story, right? So behaviours trump skills. Behaviours drive skills more yeah, than actually just focusing on those skills. And we know that in that, 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 tr that area we need to focus massively on relationships and get kids to be taken seriously. Does the environment look like that? Do we have the right stuff out there? Are we recognising how hard they work? What, what adversity they're accepting? And are we helping them to build relationships? Because there's other things coming towards us that we have to understand. And that's not that tennis isn't where it should be, it's just that tennis has to evolve. Can anyone answer this question? Last year in Arthur Ashe Stadium, Flushing Meadow, the home of the US Open, one person won three million dollars. I don't have a hat, I'm afraid. You can't answer it, you're American. Okay, all right. Yes, you can. All right, go on, who's that person? Yeah, okay. It's this kid. Karl Berger Gersdorf won $3 million. Actually, there were more people in the stadium watching the Fortnite finals than there was actually watching the US Open men's final. Okay. And he won $3 million age 16. Um, but it's highly likely that within not this next Olympics but the Olympics following or the Olympics after that so we're talking 8 or 12 years that virtual reality sport at least one will be accepted into the Olympics the head of the Olympic movement actually said at a meeting one month ago that the place of virtual reality sports was in the Olympics alongside other sports So it's interesting what an industry that creates $135 billion a year. Tennis is worth about six, right? $135 billion a year could teach us. Those are all things that we can steal and use because those things all relate to how we motivate people. And let me be really clear. I'm not saying we should all go away and spend a week watching Fortnite and create a Fortnite tennis lesson. A Fortnite tennis lesson will simply be a much more inferior version of Fortnite. Yeah, what I'm saying is that the people that design these games understand these factors. They understand that people get to choose a level at which they want to enter at. They get incremental rewards as they go along that most of the time, and this is a really interesting one, that failures get ignored. If you get shot or killed, what do you do? Push the button, go again. No one cares. Okay? The only thing that actually gets recognised is when you hit certain milestones. Yeah. When you're rewarded. Okay? And the other big thing is, a lot of this stuff is about creating community. A lot of the online stuff that we now experience, everything from Peloton now. Who can think of a more stupid thing in the world than Peloton? Sitting on a bike in your living room, riding a bike. But now if you connect picture of people all around the world, Peloton just became the unicorn in the room. It now became this must do thing, this exciting, simply because it created a community behind what we're doing. So one of the interesting things if we go back to, why do people get into sport? What do they really need? Yeah, They want to connect with other people. They want to belong, they want to be part of your club. They want to belong to your club, they want to be recognised in your club. They want you to actually know who they are when they walk through the door. They want to know that their friends are there. And that becomes a big part of your job, not just teaching tennis. Yeah, and 
As we've already said on social media, social media is amazing for us. It's a communication tool, but also it's incredibly difficult to grow up in a world of social media where everybody judges you. Yeah? Where actually everything you do is under a microscope. So feeling like you're safe and in a place where you're more competent is key. And we get right back to what are fundamental human needs. These kids still want to make friends, want to be listened to, want to be respected and acknowledged, yeah, and want to feel competent. They want to feel that. They want to say things like, instead of saying, I do tennis lessons, they want to say, I'm a tennis player. And that's so much more important for us, the way we think, than that one hour you gave that one lesson to that one group of eight kids. So if we're to actually continue to move forwards in one of the things we're doing, we need you to be the drivers that you potentially can be. We need you to actually understand that you're doing a hell of a lot more than teaching a forehand or a backhand. And if you do do a hell of a lot more than teaching a forehand or a backhand, we will keep people in the program. And Norwegian Tennis through a Tennis Kids program will continue to grow. Right, that was a bit heavy for after lunch, wasn't it? Okay, so um, please remember those will be our focuses moving forward in the next year. Yeah, we're not going to spend a lot more time focusing on the tour. It's delivering better lessons, it's helping you engage more kids, it's helping you engage more with the parents, and it's helping you to provide a lot more opportunities to do more than just take lessons and play the tour. Thanks for your time, and we'll see you on uh, Sunday, those of you that are coming. All right? Thank you. This time, no.